Good morning, I hope you've had a good week. I wonder if you've taken any time this week to go for a walk down in the village. If you do, you'll think it's a very different village than it has been for the past three or four months. And the reason for that is because the village is starting to come alive again. The Montgomery Arms next door to the church have got their tables out, so have the pub across the road. And other shops in the village are all very slowly reopening and life is coming back to our village. We're still talking as a Kirk session about worshipping back in the church and that will happen. It might not happen soon, but that will happen. Things are beginning to change and things are beginning to look up. And so for this time, we will still meet virtually as the people of God, as we worship him together. And we sing our first hymn, How Lovely is Thy Dwelling Place. of this lockdown period someone gave me a little phrase which I've been kind of pondering on during this time. This is what it says. It says, in the rush to return to normal, take this time to consider which parts of normal are worth rushing back to. Let me pose you that question this morning. Which parts of normal do you think are worth rushing back to? On Tuesday this week I was called to a commission of the General Assembly. The General Assembly didn't meet in May and they needed to to have a meeting of the commission to tighten up some of the church laws. And so the meeting was held at four o'clock. Took quarter to four, I put on the kettle, made myself a cup of tea and sat down to watch the commission. It finished about quarter to five 
and by ten to five I was back in my armchair reading the papers. Now, if that meeting had taken place in Edinburgh, I reckon I would have left East Bride about half past one. Train to Glasgow, train to Edinburgh, and then if the meeting finished at quarter to five, obviously the journey would be done in reverse. Train to Glasgow, then another train to East Bride, and I reckon I wouldn't have been back here till about half past seven. In a rush to return to normal, that's one part of normal that I really have no desire to rush back to trips to meetings in Edinburgh. And that phrase also came to mind when I received a letter from my mum's nursing home to say that they were allowing people to come and visit. Now, for the last 14, 15 weeks, every Saturday night, our whole family has had a Zoom call with my mum in the nursing home. On Saturday just past, we were on for over two hours and all our grandchildren were there, her sister was there, her nieces were there, we were all there. And it's great. It's absolutely great. And so comparing that to a visit, which has to be booked in advance, is socially distant two metres apart. You can't take her anything. So I'm thinking two metres apart, all I would do is shout at her because her hearing's not great. No gifts to take to her. If you don't turn up with Thornton's toffee to my mum, then I don't think she'll be very happy about that. I have no desire to return to driving for an hour to sit socially distant and then drive back home again. So my sister's going to go on Saturday and visit her and I'll just see her on Zoom like I've been doing. In the rush to return to normal, I think we're realising which parts of normal we don't want to rush back to. You know, God calls us to be good stewards. He calls us to be good stewards of the earth, of creation, to be good stewards of our time and our talents and obviously our money too. But during this time, I think we've come to realise what being good stewards really means and how much time we've wasted on things that really don't matter. Someone said on the Thursday coffee morning they'd gone to a garden centre down the Clyde Valley And the cafe was open and they got a coffee and a piece of caramel shortcake and they just thanked God that they had the privilege of doing that. These are the things that we want to rush back to doing. These are the parts of normal that we want to give thanks to God for. And certainly being with people in our relationships are what we want to give thanks to God for. Let us pray. God of grace and love, You know how we rely on your love, which is extended to us in all ways and at all times, extravagantly and with generosity. We live day by day, knowing that your care and concern is poured out for us in your provision for our needs and beyond our imagining. Day by day we realise the many gifts lavished upon us, and so we come to you this morning to acknowledge and praise you for all your goodness to us. Merciful God, we often appear to be choked by greed and selfishness. We indulge ourselves and ignore the needs of others. We are quick to protect what we believe is our own and forget to share the bounty you have so generously provided. We have ignored the opportunities for bringing the love that you have shown to our neighbours and to those in need. Lord, we know We are in need of mercy, care and compassion. And so now we seek your message of forgiveness and your message of restoration. But hear us now as we pray together in the words Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever. Amen. And now Angus and Dorothy are going to read to us from the scriptures. Good morning. This reading is from the Old Testament, from Messiah chapter 55, verses 10 to 13. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth 
and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Amen. Our second reading for today is Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 to 9, and reading from verses 18 to 24. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him, but he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came out, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no roots. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Some other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Now from verse 18. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but worries of his, this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Amen. We will now sing Lord of Creation. Thank you.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. I'm sure you'll all be familiar with the hymn, You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace, and the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy, and the trees of the field shall clap, shall clap their hands. Well, now you know where it comes from. Isaiah 55, verse 12. Another well-known hymn, Here I Am, Lord, is based on an earlier passage also found at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, where we have the Lord asking, Whom shall I send? And Isaiah answering, Send me. Here's a wee reminder, so that we know what the Lord is saying. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, All who dwell in dark and sin, My hand will save. I, who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? And here we have Isaiah answering, Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord. If you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. But what do the words of these two songs actually mean? Here I am is the calling of Isaiah to be a prophet. Like Samuel, Isaiah hears God speak to him in the middle of the night. And he tells God, yes, I'll do what you ask of me. Send me. His mission? Well, despite the promises made to God's chosen people through his covenants to obey his commands, God's people have once more turned their backs on God and have returned to sinning. And God says, you pray, you offer sacrifices, but your hands are full of blood. You lie, you cheat, you do wrong, and you are evil. So Isaiah's mission is to go and encourage the people to mend their ways and to turn back to God, because if they don't, when the day of the Lord comes, they will face God's judgment and be punished. But for those who do mend their ways, the day of the Lord will be a day of glory. And in our Isaiah passage, we have the Lord saying, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word that goes out of my mouth, it shall not return empty to me, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. In other words, God's word accomplishes its purpose to judge and to save, to convict and to soul, to have mercy and compassion, and to proclaim faithfulness and love. And when that word has been shared and is known, and people turn to God and mend their ways, then we shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. And in our gospel passage this morning, we have the parable of the sower. And I'm sure it is a passage that you'll all be familiar with. But what does it mean? And that's the very same question posed by the disciples. Why do you speak in parables, they ask? The reason? Jesus tells these stories so that we can be transformed. He tells these stories not so that we can ask questions about them, but so that the stories can ask questions of us. So here we have a familiar scene, namely a large crowd gathered before Jesus to listen to his preaching and his teaching. So Jesus begins by telling them about a farmer sowing seeds. 
a practice that wouldn't be unfamiliar to them. Some seeds fall on the path, a hard-worn path that the farmer has trod on time and time again through the field. The birds feed on this seed, so the seed doesn't get a chance to grow. Some seeds fall on the rocks, rocks that are, so it seems, almost everywhere, where the soil is shallow and the crops die as quickly as they grow, because there's no substance to sustain them. Some seeds fall where thorns and weeds grow, so they become, as the passage says, choked, and they pretty much go to waste. But some seeds fall on good, rich soil, and they grow up tall and straight and yield an abundant harvest. And the listeners know that this happens, but they don't necessarily know how, and they don't know why. But they're glad. They're so glad when the harvest comes that they give thanks to God that they have enough to eat. So I guess that the questions that Jesus is asking us to think about are what kind of soil are you? And what kind of sower are you? Are you the kind of soil that is a hard beaten path, downtrodden and weary, no life, no soul, barren and lifeless, ignored and forgotten? and not properly nourished? Are you the kind of soil that's rocky and has no real substance to it from which seeds can sprout? Are you the kind of soil that allows the weeds and the thorns to take over, which was once good and fertile? Or are you the rich soil that is fed and watered, tended to and cared for, nurtured and nourished? from which an abundance of shoots spring forth. What do you do to ensure that you stay this way? Secondly, what kind of sower are you? Do you ignore the downtrodden path and walk past? Do you figure that the rocky ground is too hard to tackle so you don't even bother? And what about the weeds? Do you let the weeds take over and consume the fertile soil? Or are you the sower that takes every opportunity that you can to scatter seeds, to feed, to nourish and to tend the weak? What Jesus is telling us is that we each have a dual role to play in the story. It's our responsibility to ensure that we remain nourished and fed by God's word, and that we scatter and plant seeds about God's kingdom. And every action, great or small, but done with the care of the farmer tending his crops, and with the help of God the Father, will yield such a harvest, so much so, that there'll be shouts of joy, and the trees of the field shall clap, shall clap their hands. Amen. Once more, let's come to God in prayer. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, we give you thanks for the rhythm of the seasons and the constant provision for our needs in life. We are grateful particularly at this time for the commitment of those who look after our quality of life through food production or health care or security. And yet we're aware of the injustices and ill divisions of wealth in our world and are mindful of the message of those who challenge our lifestyles and comfortable ways of living. Lord, may we treasure your word and its message and be more and more aware of our responsibility as disciples of Jesus Christ. And so, God of compassion, we come to you now and we pray for the many who are oppressed in our world may be oppressed by political and economic circumstances, may be persecuted on grounds of faith or background. Lord, we remember families torn apart by age-old feuds, jealousies and destructive attitudes based on concepts of exclusion or privilege. Lord, we remember before you the people ground down by the lack of food and opportunities the children oppressed by discrimination and disadvantages, the downtrodden 
and those who seem unable to make a positive contribution to the life of the world. Lord, empower, encourage and endorse the disciples of Jesus who try to address the needs of the isolated and the lonely. Lord, we pray for those who hear the world's poorest cry out for justice and mercy and respond without question. We pray for the intrepid to take food and water to those who are in so much need of it. And we remember the faithful who day by day take time to pray and listen attentively to other people. Lord, it's a difficult time in our world and we know that in confidence we can lay all our concerns before you, knowing that it's your world. And so we lay our concerns before you now. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our closing hymn is Lord of Creation. Put your hand in God's hand, the God of past, present and future, and walk with him wherever he may lead, knowing that he will walk with you this day and always. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.
Once again, thank you for joining with us this morning. I hope you have a good week to come. And if you want to join us for a coffee, you'll see the Zoom code at the bottom of your screen. We'd love to see you there.